them that are guide sheets, um, and then one of them is my presentation. Uh, most of my information is pulled directly from these. Uh, I'll have a little bit of variance. Um, that's why I printed out my presentation. If you're able to read some of the small print on the presentation, let me know. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to mail you a larger copy. Uh, some of those tables and numbers can be uh, quite small. So. some that look alike and uh, there's just a, a little bit of difference that causes them to be a certain breed. Um, so we're going to go over a few of the more common ones. Um, talk a little bit about incubation. If you guys are going to start out with eggs or uh, possibly get some chickens and uh, a rooster and, and uh, raise your own, uh, we'll, we'll go over a little bit about incubation. Um, brooding, which follows the incubation. Most of you are going to probably order chicks um, and over the, through the mail. And uh, so you'll have to go through the brooding process. Um, egg laying, uh, nutrition, some diseases and parasites that may affect some of your birds, and then definitely predators. There are basically two types of egg laying groups of chickens, the white eggs and the brown eggs. There's more white <coughs> egg layers than there are white egg layers. Uh, the most common chicken probably everybody is used to is the white leghorn. And then there's several different brown egg uh, layers. Plymouth Rock is a very popular one. Uh, Rhode Island Red and New Hampshire are also very popular. Um, some of the newer breeds, um, Red Sexling is actually a genetic uh, modification on, on a breed. Basically, you can see in the picture in the bottom, uh, you'll see the females and males are different colors. It helps in sorting. Uh, the the uh, females are a golden or a red, and the males are a silver or a white. And so that makes it much easier for the processing facility. It also helps guarantee that you're not going to get a rooster if you don't want one. Uh, the female <coughs> is also a sex link type uh, trait, and they're actually coming up with these in, the, in some of the regular breeds. They're trying to to uh, breed a sex link trait in some of the more common breeds so they can tell the difference uh, in the sorting facility. Our meat breeds, our Cornish crosses are probably our most common meat breeds. Um, silkies are considered a meat breed. Um, and then there are many, many dual purpose breeds. Um, the Cornish ones are up in the, the top. Um, these are a dual purpose breed down here on the bottom. Um, some of the dual purpose breeds we see are Buckeyes, New Hampshire's, Plymouth Rock, uh, Sussex is a, uh, a, a dual purpose, Delaware, Orpington, Rhode Island Reds are considered um, the brown egg layers and also a dual purpose breed and then the wine goat. Now, question, and we made some of you that own, own poultry, how do you tell the difference between a brown egg layer and a white egg layer? Yes, ma'am. The color of their earlobes. You're very correct. You would never know. You can have a white bird that lays brown eggs, and uh, simply because the earlobes are colored. So if their earlobes are white, then they lay a white egg. Um, and there, and on, on a side note, there's really no difference in nutritional value of the white egg versus the brown. Um, when you're choosing eggs to incubate, say you have a rooster and a hen, and uh, she's laying eggs, and I don't think the uh, ordinance allows for roosters, so uh, this may be at another location that you have these, um, but you uh, want to select eggs of a normal size, color, and shape. You don't want the double yolk ones, the real big ones, you don't want the little small ones, they're not going to hatch. Um, make sure they're clean, because it's very easy for those eggs, the, the shells are porous and they can absorb some of uh, any salmonella or any other disease through their shells. 
Um, pack the eggs large end up and at about 40 to 45, 45 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit for about two weeks. Um, it's not recommended to use uh, a regular refrigerator simply because there's so much variability in refrigerators. Um, if you take a thermometer and put in different spots of the refrigerator, it's amazing the difference in temperature. Um, good egg fertility is expected within four days of introducing that rooster. So it doesn't take very long for you to have start having fertile eggs once you put the rooster in there. Um, the younger chicks or chickens uh, will have more fertile eggs than the older ones. So if you're looking to incubate, you know, I would I would start uh, making sure you can kind of separate out your young animals from your older animals so you can collect those uh, more fertile eggs. When you uh, are incubating these, uh, I recommend buying just a regular store-bought incubator. Um, it seems like the ones that you can make on your own, is, although it's possible, uh, just don't seem like they have as, as much um, humidity control. And that's the biggest challenge when you're incubating eggs. Um, so keep that incubator away from any drafts, sunlight, heat source, uh, etc. You know, just a kind of a cool, dark place. Um, make sure it's clean, and I recommend sanitizing with bleach, uh, simply to kill all the bacteria and any other any viruses. Uh, like I said before, the eggs, uh, uh, the shell is very porous, and so it can bring that into the shell. Um, it's recommended to run that incubator about eight to twelve hours before starting. Uh, one that allows you to check the temperature, just make sure it's steady. Um, two that brings it up into the, up to temperature, and you're putting the eggs directly in. It's just, it's just like boiling water, you know, you put macaroni in boiling water, not in cold water and let it boil. Um, use both a wet and dry bulb thermometer, simply because it uh, helps eliminate some of the variability of temperature. Um, and when you get to those higher humidities, um, you can have some variance in the, in the vers with the wet versus the dry. Uh, maintain an average temperature of 99 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, and that half is important. Uh, the lower the temperature, the higher the temperature, the variability of the hatch. Um, and you also kind of have problems with hatching. Um, humidity is very important. About 60% humidity is what we recommend. Normal incubation time, 21 days to 21 days and 6 hours. Now, that's not exact science, but it's going to be pretty darn close. And it's amazing how Mother Nature has programmed these chicks to hatch in 21 days. Um, again, temperature changes uh, and humidity changes can, can speed up or delay the hatch. Uh, when you speed up the hatch, the chick may not be fully developed. Um, so uh, you, you may have issues. Uh, a lot of times we see issues with heat and legs when we speed up the hatch. Um, when we delay the hatch, um, a lot of times that chick simply just cannot make it out of the shell. It's weak. There's a food source in there, and they utilize that food source, and once they run out, uh, they, they get very weak, and so we have weak chicks. Um, adjusting the humidity is, is pretty important. Uh, you want to be 60-65% for the first 18 days, 70% for the last three days. Uh, so bump up that humidity the last few days. I recommend getting an egg turner. So you do not have to turn these eggs three times a day because <laughs> it's a challenge. If you do not have an egg turner, mark one side, one end of that egg with a little X so you can tell which side is which. Otherwise, it's pretty dang hard to tell. Uh, did I turn the big end or the small end? And so you kind of know the X has to be this direction on this day. Or this hour, or this time, this time, morning, noon, and night. Um, you want to turn an odd number of times, and never in a full circle, so you don't go all the way around. And basically, what that does is to prevent the chick from attaching itself to one side of the shell, and that happens um, even if you turn it, it can attach to the side of the shell. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask in the middle, because I know it's hard to. Have a question and wait till the end. So I should have said that before. Uh, during the hatching process, 
Um, about three to four days uh, before they hatch, you may want to candle them a little bit. And uh, basically, you can just kind of take a light bulb and hold it in front of a light bulb. If you see a formed chick, um, then uh, you know that it will most likely hatch. If there's not much formation going on, um, I get rid of it. Uh, be careful, don't drop it, they're going to stink. <laughs> uh, they really, really smell. Um, depending on your incubator, uh, if it has a mesh floor, most of them will have a wire mesh floor. I recommend kind of putting some sort of cheesecloth or something on the bottom, simply because when a chick hatches, those feet are going to get caught in there, and uh, you know they may not be able to upright themselves. Uh, sometimes even their feet can get caught in there. So uh, putting that cheesecloth on the on the bottom will help prevent that. Uh, hatching rate is about 80 percent. Two out of ten eggs are going to hatch. Um, not the greatest, in my opinion. Uh, but if you do everything right, you could possibly have a 100% hatch. Uh, very common. So, um, once those chicks become completely dry and fluffy, and you, you'll be able to tell, go ahead and pull them out of the incubator. Um, let the, it's about 12 hours for them to dry out. Pull them out and then put them in your brooding uh, facility. And uh, feed them and water them immediately. All right. Uh, talk a little bit more about feeding and watering in the brooding facility in just a second. Like I said, their their uh, <coughs> the yolk or the uh, the fluid uh, inside the egg is what feeds them for that extended period of time, and that runs out fairly quickly. Um, because we live in Missouri, because we never know what winter is going to be like, um, probably best to have some sort of housing for these chicks, um, and even your chickens too. Uh, the key is make sure you have some sort of ventilation. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, you know, no fans or, or whatever, just something to have some air movement. Um, chickens have a tendency to develop some respiratory problems fairly easily. Um, you know, they don't like a lot of dust. So uh, if you can have some ventilation, whether it be a window or a door open during the day, something like that, uh, it's pretty important. Um, we say a concrete floor is best simply because of sanitation. Um, it's much easier to clean if you have some sort of disease or, or bacteria that's causing problems. It's just as easy to hose it off. Um, kind of stays in the soil and kind of hard to get some of those uh, viruses and, and bacteria out of the soil. Um, make sure you have separate housing for separate ages. Chickens are notorious for picking on each other. And Hence the term pecking order. It's it's very very true. Um, you know they have that order, and once you bring, introduce new birds or or young ones, you know they're right there for the picking. Um, so definitely try to um, keep your older birds away from your younger ones. Um, temperatures of 70 to 95 degrees is a requirement for your brooding chicks. Now that's a big range. Um, once they come out of the incubator and, and for the first probably about three days, um, they're going to need to be at that 95 degree uh, temperature. And once they get a little older, they're going to start feathering and uh, they're going to be able to regulate their body temperature easier. You can back it off to 70 once they have their feathers. Lighting is pretty essential. And um, if you're looking to buy egg layers, it's it's a good idea to buy egg layers in the fall if possible. Uh, basically what that does is resets their clock. They're used to the shorter days um, and they're going to start laying quicker. Uh, if you buy um, pullets in the spring, you know, they, they're used to the longer days and once those days get shorter, they start to either cease laying or go through a molt period. Um, so uh, if you can provide them 14 hours of light a day, they'll continue laying year round. Um, but buying those uh, young chicks in the fall kind of just, they're used to the short days and they don't really get it. For litter, um, just about anything and everything can be used for litter. Some sort of absorbent material, um, preferably one that's easy to clean. Um, you know, pine shavings are probably one of the most common. Um, People have used rice hulls, peanut shells, you can see the list. Um, wood shavings are okay. Uh, try to avoid the hardwoods or the sawdust, uh, simply because sawdust is so dusty. 
Um, some of the hardwoods have what we call tannins, and if the bird decides to pick at that, it can mess with their digestive system. Um, so try to stay with the soft woods. Uh, we like a, a pretty thick layer of um, litter, simply because you put that litter down, if you're able to pull some of the wet material off, you know, you're not necessarily going to have to replace it all the time. It'll last a while. Um, removing that wet litter is very important. Right around where those waters sit, it's going to cake up and form a kind of crust. If you can pull that up, um, and right around the feeders uh, are going to be uh, prime spots. Um, if you leave that, it's a great place for bacteria to grow. Um, so, so pull that wet stuff up, stir up your litter to kind of let it dry out a little bit and helps uh, keep it more sanitary. Uh, it helps to move the feeders and waters regularly. When you have a, a pretty thick layer, you know, moving the, the waters around uh, and that way you're able to let stuff dry out every once in a while. During the brooding period, it lasts about eight weeks. Um, again, you'll need about three or four inches of litter. Uh, you may need to add more. Uh, but you won't have to clean all of it out in that more if you keep removing the wet stuff. Um, again, temperature about 95 degrees, um, drops about 5 degrees each week. And again, simply because they have feathers. They're starting to get feathers. Um, when, you, uh, when they get about 5 weeks of age, you want to maintain it about 70 degrees. Um, when you're working with some infrared heat lamps, uh, the distance from the birds is, is important. Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to eventually have to raise it. And uh, watching the birds is the key on temperature control. If they're huddling under that heat lamp as close together as they possibly can, they're cold. And you need to either lower it or increase the heat. Um, if they're kind of just milling about, you know, pretty happy, some are kind of under the heat, some are kind of off to the side, they're, they're, you're probably maintaining it correctly. <coughs> If they're all pushed up against the edges, you know you got too hot in there. So watch your birds. Uh, you know you don't want to cook chicken at that early age. If you want an egg layer, it doesn't help. <laughs> so space requirements. There's all different kinds of ways you can um, have a brooder facility. Pretty well, the best way is in a circle. Um, I'm sorry, but chickens are dumb. They get in the corner and they can't figure out where the water is, they can't figure out where the feed is. So if you have a circle and you have your feed and water placed uh, strategically or about, they'll eventually trip over it and find it. So uh, a circle works best for these root facilities. And it can be just a cardboard, you know, circle, nothing fancy. Um, you know you'll need to remove the chickens when they start jumping over that. Uh, place them into another one. And one will jump over and uh, you'll put it back and then you'll find another one the next day jump over it may not be the same chicken and finally all of them figure out hey let's all jump and so then you need just to remove your uh, cardboard circle um, space requirements it as they grow you have to adjust so uh, you're looking at about a half a square foot at the beginning and then moving up to one square foot uh, once they get to that eight weeks of age feeder space um, you can kind of see about how many, you gotta measure the feeder and you'll know how many feeders to buy. Um, we want them to have continuous feed, so uh, make sure there's enough space for all of them to eat. Um, again, water is kind of like the feed, you know, uh, you're gonna need up to five gallons for 100 chicks, so you can kind of calculate that out how much um, water and space you need. Um, Keeping the litter dry is really important. I know I hit on that earlier, so, so kind of try to maintain that. That's, that's your quality control. That's your uh, disease prevention uh, this early of age. Um, if you have a problem with cannibalism, and you know, it's, it's one of those things that's not very common, but once they start, it's like they learn from each other, and they're going to pick, find one of them, and they're all going to pick on that one. So. Uh, Sometimes you can trim those beaks to prevent cannibalism, and that's purely an option, totally up to you. Um, so, uh, you know, whether it be humane or not, most of the time it doesn't bother. It's kind of like trimming your fingernail. Uh, so, but that's up to you. 
Um, again, 14 hours of daylight or light. And we talked about uh, floor space. Once they get a little older, they're going to need about two square foot. Uh, a full mature bird needs anywhere from three to four square foot, depending on the type of bird you have. Um, there's there's a, you know, our bandies, which are smaller. Um, and then we have some smaller, large breeds, too, that may not require as much space. Um, water is very important in the summer. Um, not so much in the winter. They don't drink near as much. But in the summer, you'd be surprised how much a bird drinks. So do pay attention to that. And try to make sure it's fresh and clean. This is a simple um, layer house. Uh, you can see there's some uh, nest boxes off to the side over here. And it's just basically a plywood box you know, with, some, with windows for some ventilation. Nothing fancy. Um, you know, you can revamp an old shed and uh, achieve the same, uh, same effect. If you're looking to uh, have egg production, hens start to lay about 16 to 24 weeks of age. And there's such a wide range because of the breeds. You know, your smaller breeds are going to start laying early, your larger breeds tend to uh, lay a little bit later. Um, they need daylight in order to set their biological clock and uh, uh, begin to lay. Um, you're not going to get an egg a day, necessarily. Um, you may get an egg every other day. And that's what I would kind of plan on. Um, when they start to lay, those eggs can be really tiny. So don't be afraid that your uh, big Rhode Island, Rhode Island Red is laying a little bitty egg. You know, that's just normal starting out. Uh, they'll adjust. And uh, sometimes those eggs can even be kind of without a shell. Um, you know, it's just getting the development process going correctly. Um, a lifespan of a chicken is roughly five years. Um, that's just kind of an average. I know most chickens will live longer than that. Uh, but just know that uh, they're laying an egg every day and they just wear out. So um, one nest for every three to four chickens is completely adequate. A lot of times chickens will lay, uh, two or three chickens will lay in the same nest. So mm -hmm. um, some of them have their favorite and all of them will lay, lay in one nest. So uh, do pay attention to that. Um, maybe try to move some of the eggs into another nest to say, hey, it's okay to lay over here too. Put the litter in the nest boxes to uh, prevent egg breakage. And, and some of the most common nest boxes is uh, litter is straw, uh, simply because it's, it's longer, it kind of stays in the box. It's a little better. It's a lot easier to clean out than some of those shavings. Yes? Do chickens lay for their entire life? They can, yes. Uh, once they get older, you'll start to see some odd eggs. Um, you know, the, again, kind of like the, the young ones have a misshaped shell, or they won't have a shell at all. Uh, laying generally becomes very infrequent. So that's kind of something. Sometimes you won't know if you have several chickens out there. Sometimes you won't know uh, that one is not necessarily laying until she really starts, uh, and I'll show you how to tell, but she really starts you know, gaining a lot of weight and, and looking really pretty, basically. Uh, that one that's not laying is going to be the prettiest one in your pen. So uh, here, at, here's the uh, and the picture is kind of hard to tell. Um, if she's laying a lot, her eyes, kind of uh, eyelids, are going to be white, are very bleached out. Her vent, um, which is on the, the picture to the right, is going to be kind of bleached out um, right there around the. Uh, the hole is, is a little bit uh, darker, but once you get around the edges, it's going to be kind of bleached out. Feathering is going to be very minimal back there. It's going to look really ragged. Um, I mean, she's, she's producing. She's doing work. Um, if they're healthy, they're going to have some very vibrant color on their uh, combs, so that's not going to bleach out. Their beaks will be bleached out. Uh, so if you see a uh, yellow-eyed, yellow beak, pretty feathered, Pin running around, maybe time to start a pot of chicken and dumplings. <laughs> so. Molting, very common. Um, typically, it occurs for anywhere from two to six weeks. Um, 
Um, basically, they just lose their feathers and stop laying. Um, you can see uh, they're going to start with their axial feathers and move their feathers all the way around. Um, so if you're going to try to prevent the molt, to so keep them laying, um, if, you, if you don't want them to go through that process, you need to provide that light. 12 to 14 hours is pretty necessary. Um, make sure they have plenty of food and water and uh, they're warm in the winter. Um, so those short daylight hours is what causes them to go through the molt. Um, you can also, I, I kind of skipped down, stress can also cause molt, um, food and water. Sometimes you, if you change feed and they don't like it so well, they can go through a molt. You know, it, it, there's, there's certain things that can trigger that. Um, disease is also another thing you may have um, causing molt. Um, when you collect those eggs, I highly recommend doing it twice a day. Um, the reason being, if you have one break and the chicken starts to peck at that and likes the taste of it, she's going to keep breaking some eggs. Um, once you have that kind of cannibalism going, um, it's probably best to get rid of that chicken that's doing that because um, she's not going to stop. So uh, to kind of prevent that, gather your eggs twice a day. Make sure you kind of clean those off. You, know, you don't want dirty eggs in the refrigerator. Um, it's, if you um, want to wash your eggs, again, they're pretty porous, so um, some of that is going may possibly get through the egg. But if you want to wash those eggs, use a non-foaming soap um, or dishwashing liquid. Um, don't let them soak in there; just kind of, you know, wash them off uh, pretty quickly. Um, you can sanitize the eggs with a, a bleach solution, and there's again, there's tablespoon to a gallon of water, that's not much bleach. Um, make sure you dry those eggs before storing them in the refrigerator. For water, you know, this is just kind of common sense. You want them to have clean, fresh water. You want to take care of your animals. Uh, you want to make sure they're happy. The happy animals are the ones that are going to produce for you. Um, 100 layers can drink 6 to 8 gallons per day. If uh, if so, if you're, I know, I know you're probably not going to get that many, but, um, you know, so make sure your water is full um, and uh, make sure it's clean. A lot of times in the hot weather, that water can get pretty warm pretty quick. So uh, you may have to change that out. And there's an example, just a kind of common water, you know, plant <coughs> works really well. Um, you know, it's not going to rust. Some of those metal waterers will rust. Um, plastic's pretty easy to clean um, and sanitize, so probably the way to go. When um, we talk about feed, chickens are, are some of those that um, they require a lot of little things, little amino acids um, like lysine, methionine, um, and those can get pretty expensive if you're trying to mix your own feed. So I recommend just going to the feed store and buying the mix that they have. You know, they produce a huge batch of these, of these and bag them up and, uh, you know, have them there at the feed store to where they make it more economical to do that than to try to mix yourself. Um, also, you know, there's not a whole lot of difference in, in these uh, poultry feeds. So if you're going to pick up some laying mash, you know, uh, check at the different feed stores on prices. They are checked for sales. Um, you know, it's not cheap. Uh, most of the laying mashes are going to be corn based, but there is other things in there, vitamins and minerals that uh, you may not be able to see. Um, you're going to have. You're not going to be able to feed all of your chickens of different ages the same thing. Uh, there's basically kind of three types of uh, rations that you buy: a starter ration for your your brooding chicks a grower ration for um, those that are out of the brooder about eight weeks or you know, five to eight weeks and then your laying ration um, because your broilers are going to um, be um, slaughtered before you they get a laying age so um, so so from zero to 21 days that first three weeks you really need to uh, have a uh, starter ration basically that's very palatable they're going to go to eat it right away and uh, it has a lot of nutrition in there. Um, 
your layers, uh, six weeks for your starter. Um, since they're going to be around a little bit longer than your broilers, they need a little bit more nutrition, they're going to grow more. Um, and then you need a developer or grower for about 18 weeks, followed by a layer ration once they start laying. Make sure they have free, fo free choice feed. Um, birds are like cats. You know, they'll go and take a little nibble and then they'll go off. And then they'll take another little nibble and go off. Their stomachs aren't real big. And so they can only eat so much at a time. Um, so having that available all the time uh, will help them grow properly. Um, the feeders need to have something on them to where they can't get in them. Um, and you can have the feeders that have the kind of sloped top. Um, you know, chickens are notorious. They're going to walk over anything. You know, they're going to step on it. They may just kind of stand in there and decide that, uh, you know, they want to add some else, something else to it. So uh, either have something to where they can't stand on there very comfortably or it's going to make it slide off. Wire mesh, they don't care to stand on wire mesh very much. So uh, you can put some wire mesh over the top of that. Um, they can still get their beak in there, but uh, they're not going to be willing to stand on there for an extended period of time. Um, again, we talked about the commercially prepared diets. Make sure you feed what's directed on the bag. Sometimes you can buy some that you can add corn to to maybe cheapen it up a little bit. But make sure it says that on the bag. Because um, if you buy a regular laying mash and you add more corn to it or something else to it, basically you're diluting out all the nutrition that they're supposed to be getting. So they're going to get less protein. They're going to get less of those amino acids and minerals. Um, so be sure to follow the directions on the feed bag. Um, that feed tag is also, on that bag, is also going to tell you what's in it um, and, you know, where it's from, whether it's medicated. So, uh, you know, that tag isn't a bad thing to keep. Um, so just rip that off and kind of maybe keep it there in the shed or something like that so you kind of know what, what you've been feeding and if you need to go back and get something else. Oyster shells or uh, chicken scrap is uh, something you may uh, need to buy. Basically it enhances shell strength. It's kind of a calcium. Um, makes the shells a little harder. Um, and it can be, be Fred free choice. Uh, I recommend just kind of supplementing as needed. Um, sometimes they'll favor one feed over the other. If they eat too much oyster shells, they're not going to get uh, the nutrition they need from the other. Uh, so if you have some chickens laying, you know, some chickens that have been in production, they start to lay some soft eggs, um, the shell's kind of soft, you know, go ahead and get some oyster shells and see if that helps out. If you're going to feed food scraps, um, that's okay. Make sure it's just a treat for them. You know, toss some out. If they eat it in 10 to 20 minutes, uh, that's plenty. Um, you know, don't set a bowl out and keep filling it, keep filling it, because they're going to want to eat that instead of the, uh, the feed. It's like candy for them. So uh, do pay attention to that. Some nutrients. Um, what we're looking at on our younger animals, you can see there's a huge difference in protein content uh, from the, the feeding the younger animals as opposed to the, uh, the older animals until you get to the layers. We like to see a 16 to 18 percent uh, protein uh, ration. Um, calcium is very important in your egg layers. You can see it's not so important uh, as much. It's important but not as much in your younger birds. Um, the uh, broilers, we want to add some fat to that diet uh, simply because it's going to help them put on the muscle um, a lot quicker. Uh, we want those animals to grow fairly quick so we can have a quick turnaround time. Mm -hmm. So uh, do uh, note that you probably need the extra fat than some of your normal rations. Feed amounts. And this is um, uh, a chart total feed per bird. So what your day old to six weeks old, they're going to eat four pounds in that time period. Um, so this kind of table is really good for planning and how much feed you're going to need throughout the period. Um, so if you're growing some, uh, some layers, um, you're going to need um, four plus 46 plus 140 pounds per. 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 
You're going to add all these numbers together to get them to 70 weeks, basically. Pounds per bird. So you're talking 70 weeks. So you're talking a year, over a year's worth of feet. If I were an adult bird, what would that be per day? It's basically 154 pounds per day. year. Per, well, 70 weeks. 52 weeks in a year, so a year. One in a third year, something like that. Does that make sense? If you're raising a, a brown egg layer, you're going to need 250 pound sacks of feet. About, no, three feet. It's about two pounds a week the way it works. Yeah. If you take 70 minus 19, it gives you. 51 weeks, which is a year, divided by the 104 pounds is about two pounds per week. You can buy anything for each for each for each. Yeah. Or is it like a couple of cups per day? And it depends on the age. <laughs> I mean, and that's a thing. Weigh that cup, you know, to know. You know, get a little postal scale and weigh that cup. It's hard to tell what a pound is. Um, you know, people will say, well, I feed it. They'll ask me, well, I feed a coffee can full of feed to my horse a day. I said, well, how, how big is the coffee can? Is it one of the little ones or one of the big You know, how much does it weigh? <laughs> Feeds weigh different. Um, so your starter uh, ration may weigh something, uh, you know, maybe a lot heavier than your later ration, too. So that's something to think about. Okay. So basically you need, for if you're growing some broilers, you need about nine pounds for the life of that bird. So that kind of gives you an idea of how much feed you need, how much it's going to cost you to grow that animal out. And if you can't read that table in your, your handout, let me know. Medicated feeds, and I had said to, to look at that feed tag, make sure that you're paying attention. Um, a lot of times those, those feeds can come with a medication in them if you ask for it. Um, that most of the time it's going to be a bright colored label, pink or, or red or yellow, orange, something like that. Most of the time it's pink. Uh, it's going to say this has an antibiotic in it. And the reason why that's so important that you follow that label is almost all antibiotics have some sort of withdrawal period. Um, simply because that antibiotic can stay in the meat or can be in the egg um, for an extended period of time. and a lot of people have an allergy to antibiotics. So if you're, you're feeding this, you're, say you're selling eggs, or you're eating them yourself, um, you can have some uh, reaction just by eating um, the meat or the eggs that contains antibiotics. So, so you're, you're talking about you know, some drugs that um, can stay in that animal for an extended period. Um, <coughs> Coccidia stats are probably the most common um, type of medication. Uh, birds are notorious for coccidiosis. Uh, it's not necessarily something that kills them, they just get it. Um, it's recommended to add to the broiler rations until about a week before slaughter. It takes about a week for that to get out of their system. Um, you can add it to the layer rations until they're about 16 weeks old, which is right as they start laying. Uh, most of the time those first eggs are not very viable uh, to use for food anyways. So um, it takes that long for that uh, medication to get out of their system. Um, some of the trade names of some of the coccidio stats are, are shown down here. So if you're going to go um, purchase some, then uh, you may need to know some of the trade names. Antibiotics. Um, are also important not only to help prevent disease but also treat disease. Um, a lot of broiler uh, facilities will add some medication just to simply prevent. Um, their lifespan is so short that if one gets sick, you'd be surprised how much it costs to try to treat it and get it over that sickness. Um, you know, those facilities are, are all in, all out. You know, those birds start out one day old and go all the way to the eight weeks um, and all of them get slaughtered at the same time. So uh, it's, it's very important for them to maintain um, the feed efficiency all through that uh, time period. Um, 
If you have birds that are sick, probably the easiest way to treat those is through the water, if your animals are drinking still. If injections are possible, I would start with an antibiotic in the water to treat those birds. Um, penicillin is one of the most common. Um, the chlorotetracycline and oxytetracycline are also pretty popular. Um, again, uh, if you are treating laying birds, follow those withdrawal periods. You, if that bird is still let, sick, if it's sick and still laying, don't eat those eggs. So basically what that means is you're going to have to separate that sick bird out if you're treating them with antibiotics and throw away those eggs. Because um, as, as I said before, they like to lay in the same nest pretty often. And so you're not going to know which one uh, produced which eggs. We, caught, we talked a little bit about cannibalism and egg picking. Um, some of the things that cause molt are, are some of the things that cause picking. Um, one of the uh, uh, funny things is sunlight. Birds are attracted to something shiny. Um, you throw something shiny out there, they're going to go right to it and try to figure out what it is. So uh, if, if you have some sunlight streaming in there and it, and it catches, say, you may wing band your birds, which is a little metal band on their wing. On their wing you know, those birds are going to pick it back. So um, if the bird is injured, they're also going to pick on it. So do pay attention to that, too. Um, a, good, a good thing if you have an injured bird to isolate it, keep it away from the rest. Um, new birds, especially roosters, uh, they're going to have to establish that pecking order. So uh, um, if you're introducing something new, you maybe do a, a fence line introduction or something like that. Gradually introduce to the rest of the flock. Um, when the chicken begins to peck, and we and we talked about this uh, just a little bit ago, go ahead and get rid of her. She's got that taste. She knows where it comes from. She's going to continue to do it. Um, if you want to prevent that, try to shade the windows. You know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, something to maybe let a little bit of light in that just kind of filters it. Um, avoid crowding those birds. If they're in too small of an area, they're going to get bored and they're going to do something. You know, and they're going to just pick at the nearest neighbor. Um, make sure to have plenty of food and water. Uh, they'll want to fight over it if you don't have enough. Um, if you have aggressive birds, I recommend trimming those beaks uh, to prevent that. Um, if you're collecting eggs, it's, if one is setting on a nest, um, I would try to avoid that. Um, you may upset her, she may break an egg and then think, hmm, what is that? So, uh, collect the eggs in the morning, uh, that's probably the best time, or um, before, they, before they go up to roost of an evening before dark. Um, we talked about a little bit of this with a medication, but coccidiosis is very costly, uh, mainly in the broiler industry. And they just lose, you know, they don't want to eat, they don't want to drink, and they lose weight. Um, symptoms are uh, diarrhea. A lot of times, you know, chickens are some of those that they don't act sick until they're dead. And uh, you just find dead birds out there. You don't know what's wrong. And, you know, they don't have diarrhea. They don't, they'll eat that morning and be dead that evening. So uh, some of those, most of the diseases are fairly quick. Um, so uh, coccidiosis is one of those things that, uh, you know, they may have a little bit of diarrhea that you may not notice. Um, they may be a little unthrifty, but that could be, you know, just a high producing uh, hen too. You know, she doesn't look the greatest feather wise. Um, so a lot of times the birds will get over this. Uh, they'll become immune to it. Um, however, there's nine different strains of coccidiosis, so until they have all those nine different strains, they're not going to be completely immune to coccidiosis. Um, so that's kind of something you can kind of work on. Sanitation is a, an excellent prevention. I don't know what unthriftiness means. Is it tied to it? Basically, uh, they look bad, you know, they're not wearing feathers, they're losing feathers. Not that they aren't sick. No, no. I mean, they just look bad. Foul cholera is another disease we kind of see every once in a while. Um, it's a bacterial infection. Um, and basically, it's going to 
if you have it, it's possibly going to kill your whole flock. So uh, it's, it's one of those things that sudden death is very um, common. Um, if you see any type of uh, respiratory problems or a discoloration, feet and legs swelling, um, you know, be aware that uh, this is one of the diseases. Yes, ma'am. How do you know that you're suppressed? <laughs> it's, it's just. It's unthrifty. Yeah. They're not eating, they're not drinking, they're just kind of huddled in the corner by themselves. Yeah, they're just not doing you. They feel yeah. bad. And you know that you can yeah. tell they feel bad. Okay. It's just like you, you don't want to, when you're sick, you want to lay in bed. Yeah, that's what they want to do. The, the ruffle of feathers and kind of. Um, antibiotics is, is this is a treatable disease, so antibiotics is um, tetracyclines are probably one of the more common ones. Sanitation again is a, a good preventative. Um, sanitation and predatory control is very important. Um, you know, keep your litter clean. Um, a lot of you will have maybe them running around in a uh, fenced off area, and that's fine. You know, that helps keep the litter out of or the manure out of. Uh, a small uh, area, but um, you know, keeping that clean. Rodents are a huge issue. You know, they're going to come in, go after the feed since you have it out all the time. You know, so they're going to um, defecate in your area. The chickens are going to eat it. You know, it's just a vicious circle. Um, wild birds are also an issue. You know, they see the feed too, uh, especially if you're in a, in a backyard situation. You have a small. Uh, chicken flock there, and you have bird feeders hanging from the trees. You know, they're going to go to the bird feeders and they're going to go to the chicken coop and eat the, the chicken feed too. Fowl pox is another um, disease that we can see. I recommend trying to vaccinate for it if possible. There's no treatment for it. Basically, the animal is going to die. Um, most of the time, you, uh, you'll see some respiratory problems with this. This is a major respiratory uh, issue. <coughs> so, Merrick's disease, if you order from a hatchery, uh, I highly recommend going ahead and getting your animals vaccinated with Merrick's disease. Almost all hatcheries will do that for a, a small fee. Um, it's, uh, there's no treatment for it, and uh, it's easily spread. Um, you know, it's it's through the air, uh, so once one chicken gets it, the rest of them are not going to go to. Uh, so go ahead and have a vaccination uh, done at the hatchery before your chicks are shipped out. Newcastle disease is another one that doesn't have a treatment. Um, however, we don't see a lot of Newcastle disease. Um, most Newcastle disease is kind of over in Europe. Um, so. Uh, what some of the problems we've seen is uh, kind of illegal chickens that have been brought in is, is kind of why we've seen an outbreak here and there. So uh, I wouldn't worry a whole lot about this, just want you to be aware that it's there. And if you see on the symptoms, they're almost all the same for all these diseases. You know, respiratory or you know, the animal's depressed. So um, it's very hard to diagnose a disease unless you get involved with your veterinarian, you know, have blood drawn or have samples sent off, and that can get expensive. So, um, I hate to say this, but chickens aren't very expensive. <laughs> so, it's, it's easy to replace them. Avian influenza. Um, we've had uh, issues with this. Um, this is very highly pathogenic. Um, there's two type, two strains, high pathogenic and low pathogenic. It can be spread to humans. Um, it's it's not very common. Um, what we saw over in in um, Asia is people were actually living with their chickens, and the sanitary conditions were an issue. Um, you having a backyard flock is not necessarily going to say you're going to get avian influenza. You know, just practice good sanitation, wash your hands. Um, so. Migratory birds are the big issue with this. Um, geese can be uh, a carrier, so um, you know that's that can be an issue if you live next to a city lake that has geese on it. Um, you know that that may be a problem that crops up. Uh, you can bring it from other poultry farms, so um, if you do 
on your extensive, extensive research of uh, getting chickens, if you visit a poultry farm and you have chickens at home, you may want to wash your shoes or wash your hands, change clothes, that kind of thing. Um, borrowing loaning equipment, um, <coughs> loaning water to your neighbor without properly sanitizing it can spread disease. So, uh, you know, be wary of that introducing new birds uh, can also be an issue. Some of the clinical signs, uh, some of the same we've already seen. Um, sudden death is probably one of the most common. That's uh, so why I have it listed first. There's a very high mortality rate once it spreads through. Uh, once it gets one, it's probably going to spread through the rest. Um, abnormal, those animals that are not severely affected may have abnormal eggs. Um, they'll have swelling of the head, um, even on down through the feet. Purple discoloration, nasal discharge, diarrhea. So, uh, you know, it's a laundry list of symptoms. For preventing the diseases, you know, just proper sanitation is key. Um, you know, clean the, the houses. If you're doing a broiler operation, you know, you're having an all in, all out mm -hmm. type thing. Um, you know, clean those houses in between bird sets. Um, keep your equipment clean. Keep the litter clean. Um, ventilation is key, you know, because of the respiratory issues. The hardest thing is going to be to limit those wild birds and rodents. Um, you know, we can't even do it in our house. What makes me makes us think we can do it in our chicken house? So uh, that's that's kind of a key. Um, you can vaccinate for the fowl pox, vaccinate for the various diseases. Predator control. Um, we are seeing uh, a lot of, uh, you know, these wild animals inside uh, city limits, fairly common. Um, some of the biggest threats that we have are, are dogs and cats, uh, simply because they're everywhere. Um, some of the others, um, uh, if you, not necessarily if you live in town, but foxes, hawks, and coyotes um, are also issues. Uh, during the night, we see Cats are just a problem all the way around, the chickens. <laughs> but uh, raccoons, possum, larger rodents uh, will kill chickens. Um, or they'll eat the eggs. Snakes can be an issue. So uh, there are a lot of predators. Um, the key to keeping predators out, and snakes are a little bit harder, but bury that chicken wire 6 to 12 inches into the ground. Um, you know, Rodents like uh, raccoon, rodents, raccoons, possums, they're notorious for just going right under the fence. Um, so if you can bury that into the ground, you can kind of prevent that. Um, it's also like you did, you know. So uh, bury that out, maybe make it uh, uh, flow out a little bit to prevent that. Uh, a quarter inch hardware cloth uh, works really well. <clears throat> and that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? There's a lot of information. Yes. Yes, when we start killing all these uh, varmints, dogs and cats, what are repercussions, you know? Do you have an answer for that in the city limits? Well, you don't people are not supposed to allow their dogs and cats to run at large. I know they do, but they're not supposed to. So you can call the sheriff's department, the police department, and they'll come try and catch them. Uh, you cannot destroy someone's property without consequences. So I can't be fashion as to uh, eliminating you know, in that fashion. Right, but the other, you know, the stumps and stuff like that, are they legal with this shooting? You know, that's a good no. question. <laughs> I have uh, been told and I believe that the wildlife is the property of the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so uh, keep that in mind. On the other hand, what about an armadillo then? Yeah, I said that. <laughs> 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 like I don't do. Your, your best bet is to prevent them. We raise a lot of birds. We, I'm the county 4-H project leader for the chickens. We probably have uh, 70 birds on our place. And I brought one with me. She's a big, tiny thing. Uh, the best thing you can do is just prevent them from getting in. Around her pen, 
I have dog kennel panels around the bottom of the pen. I have uh, sheets of metal. And surrounding the whole pen up over the top, I have anti-bird netting. You can get it at Home Depot. It's $19 for a 15 by 45 foot <coughs> section. It is the best investment you will make. It will keep the wild birds out of your pen, which will keep them from bringing in bird mites. It will keep snakes out of your pen. If you take it and lay it loosely around the base of your pen, I have found several snakes woven into that mm -hmm. that weren't able to then get to my birds. <coughs> it's cheap and effective. But when you put it over the pen, hang something shiny or dangly from it, because I can tell you it is no fun to try to pick the hawk that was trying to get your chickens out of that net. <coughs> <laughs> the, the, the answer to your question really, <coughs> no, you can't kill it. That's, we get a lot of calls at the extension office about that. Unless it's a feral hog or an animal that is threatening you, your family, your, your property, uh, you can't kill a wild animal. Questions about that? Rob Solkowski is our conservation agent in the county. Uh, you, can, you can give us a call at the office. We're happy to give you Rob's number or it's in the phone book. He works out of his home. And I know you need to run. What other questions do you have? Really? I have one really quick. My problem is if I get any mice in my chicken coop, my chickens are on it. And is that harmful? Will they? I mean, it's, it's amazing to see them here. They, they can spread disease is the only thing, you know, okay. and it's not a definite, you know, that that mouse has any type of disease. Right. Uh, the birds can fight off whatever disease it brings, but just know that it could be a source, um, you know, and that you may need to uh, do something to either have rodent control or, or uh, um, you know, feed an antibiotic or something like that. Yeah. So do know it's a source. You know, there's no way you can keep everything away from these. You're going to have some chickens die. You're going to have something get the chickens. It's it's just inevitable. Um, but knowing maybe what causes it can help you to prevent it. Got questions for Kendra? Yes. Um, when going to buy chicks, I see some places say that uh, these birds have been tested for corn typhoid. Uh -huh. typhoid. It's just, just another disease. Um, and you have to have that to exhibit at the fairs, too. So any birds that are exhibited have to be tested for that and test negative. Um, so basically, it's, it's a, a typhoid disease that uh, is spread and very fatal uh, to the flock. You know, very contagious and so once they say that they're tested negative then, then you can be assured that you're not bringing that on to your property yeah our flock is tested yearly um, the state of Missouri does not charge we're extremely lucky in Illinois and in many other states you have to pay for the testing they come out they take a couple drops from each bird of blood and test it right there on your property hmm. And then our birds are also tested for avian influenza every year. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. If you have uh, questions after today, give us a holler. We'll forward your question. We'll give you Kendra's email address. Or <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it. Let's put the button on there. Yeah, so we'll cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you guys. Jody serves some these chickens or horses. So I do want to put a real plug in real quick if you have children and are interested in a 4 H chicken project or poultry project or any 4 H project involving livestock, talk to Jody uh, before we leave tonight. I want to turn it over here to Mark and Toma here for a minute. Mark, our city administrator. No, because we're only going to be a few more minutes, right? I don't know anything about chickens. <laughs> no, but tell us a little bit about the new ordinance. Uh, we'll see if you have any I'm a city administrator for the city. And I promised I was not sitting around my office with nothing to do and thought, oh, we need to have chicken regulations. 
what happened was, uh, the guy came in, he said, I'm thinking about moving to St. Genevieve. And I heard that I could keep chickens. So we researched the ordinance and found that the ordinance was totally ambiguous on the issue. It prohibited the breeding of livestock and it, and, and it defined chickens as part of livestock. So the conclusion was you can't breed chickens. But it didn't say anything about being able to keep chickens. But I wasn't going to worry about it because I was told, well, you know, folks that have chickens that seem to leave, and it wasn't a problem. Nobody was knocking on my door suggesting to me that I should do something about it. Then a former alderman spoke to the mayor and said, I think the city should adopt a code that allows people to keep chickens in their residential, on their residential property within the city limits. So I started doing research on the internet, which is where we all go for research these days, and I was astounded at the wealth of information that is out there and organizations that exist to promote urban chickens or domestic fowls or whatever you want to call it. So I went to a Board of Aldermen meeting and I said, okay, this has been brought to my attention. What would you like to do? And they asked me to research it further and come back with recommendations as to what common sense regulations we might adopt. So we did that, we advertised it, we had a public hearing in which no one showed up, and I should have held it here. And, uh, and so we uh, ended up with an ordinance that I have distributed to all of you, and it does allow people to maintain chickens within the city. The ordinance doesn't have any grandfathering provisions, so even if someone owned chickens and kept maintained them on their property prior to the adoption of the ordinance, uh, they would still need to come in and get a permit and keep the chickens in accordance with the standards that we have adopted, many of which are addressed in the earlier presentation. We decided that four should be the limit, four hens, no roosters. So you still can't breed chickens in the city. But you can maintain uh, chickens for eggs or meat later. Um, it, it, if you, if you maintain them in the conditions that are outlined in the ordinance, which also has a bunch of legal ease in it, and in this application. you got to have a coop. You've got to have a run. You've got to have sanitary conditions. You've got to have containers that are rodent-free for your feed. There isn't much in here that common sense doesn't dictate and that is inconsistent with what you've just been told. It's a $10 annual fee. If you come in and apply, the inspector will go out, the code official, and he'll look to make sure you've got the coop and you've got the run and you've got it set back properly and, uh, and he'll say fine. And then you can go about your business. A year later, it's renewable. And the reason for that is to make sure that people are continuing to maintain their facilities in accordance with the, with the ordinance. The ordinance is there to ensure that people who maintain the chickens, and I, and I say that as opposed to domestic fowl, because there are a lot of regulations that allow people to maintain geese and emus and whatever. Uh, so we decided it would be limited to chickens of any breed. Um, and the, um, the idea is that it should not be disrupted to the neighbor. Uh, it should be maintained in a healthy sanitary condition to avoid the, 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 the creation of and spread of disease. And I think we have a pretty common sense set of guidelines. But it's, it, while it is written and adopted, it isn't fixed in stone. I mean, I don't pretend that I know everything I need to know about this. And there may be some problematic stuff in there. And I'm hoping that over in the coming weeks and months, people will come to me and say, you know, this just doesn't make any sense. You should change that. We could always change the ordinance if we, if we screwed up somewhere along the way. Uh, and, we're, and I'm certainly willing to consider that. Uh, so anyone who currently has chickens, please call City Hall. Uh, if you would like to start raising chickens, not raising chickens, make, keeping chickens in your residential property within the city limits, 
Uh, you've already got the information you need to come in and, and get the permit. And uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. I've got that's a question. about all I know. What's, what's the penalty for not getting a permit if you've got chickens in the Well, there's only one penalty for violating the codes and ordinances of the city unless otherwise specified. And it's a dollar fine and potential jail time. Uh, so, oh. but, but that, that what happens is you get a citation, you're asked to remedy or mitigate the violation within a certain number of days. If you don't, then you gotta come before the municipal judge and say, this is why I couldn't or why I didn't. And the judge says, well, please do it. It's only when somebody just totally ignores things that the penalties are ever ever imposed. Because we, my philosophy as a code official is that, that compliance is the goal, not punishment. Yeah. So we, we seek cooperation. And 99.9% and, and .9 of the time we don't. We, we do, occasionally we don't. And then the prosecuting attorney for the city and the municipal judge have to deal with that person. And I've been here almost two years and there are only two of those. To prove it, it, except for traffic violations. But there are only, only two people who wouldn't clean up their property, that we had to go all the way through the process. So if, um, I, I, get, I take it you're open to changes in the law down the line from what you said I, in the ordinance. So if people want to make comments on that, they should drop it line? Yeah, here's my card. I'll okay, leave so these up here, anybody take it. Numbers on it, emails on it, cell phones on it. Call me, come by and see me, and uh, we'll, we'll We'll consider it. Normally what I do for these things is when somebody comes to me and says I want to change things, I'll have a informal meeting with the Board of Aldermen before the formal meeting and say what do you what, what direction you want to go? And then they'll they'll direct me. Questions for Mr. Toma. Yes. Uh, you're saying city limits. Do you have a map of the city limits? I do. Oh, okay. You'll know if you're in the city limits if you pay your taxes, it'll be a city tax office. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not the city, you're good. Are there any public places to dispose of any of this waste? Um, or is it just a matter of finding somebody to get that on your own? Yeah, we do not have a, a place for the public disposal of the waste. So oh, as you read, the stuff. yeah, that's for tree waste. Well, Mary Ann, is that something that we can put into the trash? She's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't compost. Yeah, I'm compost. If you have the ability to compost. Yeah. I guess it wouldn't be any different than picking up your dog as you do it. It'd be probably less offensive. Than that. Question in the back? Yes, ma'am. Does this ordinance and uh, bill pertain only to chickens? Only chickens. Only chickens. What you said at the beginning, then you went back and looked through the ordinances and you found, did you find an ordinance against raising any kind of breeding, any kind of animals within the city limits? Because this one is just chickens now. The ordinance that existed prohibited the breeding of livestock. Livestock, okay. And when it listed the animals that were covered by livestock, fowl okay. was one of those. But the breeding of those animals. Right. It did not prohibit keeping keeping, keeping them potentially. Okay. But the board the board suggested that that the keeping of them could be problematic and that we should establish some guidelines. So and that's going to keep camels. <laughs> yeah. In the city, I learned about mites, bird mites. So there's this horror story of a guy who had bird mites and infected his neighbors. And I, you know, I never heard of bird mites. But, uh, so, yeah, that's what I've discovered. Other questions for Martin about the ordinance? Uh, well, the code official is Brenda Schloss, but Jimmy Jones is the inspector, so he'll, he's not inspecting the chickens. We, we, <laughs> I asked him what kind of a chicken sexery he was, he told me he didn't know. We'll send Haley out to the front. Uh, <laughs> but, but, 
again, it, it, he's going to be looking for the size of, of the, just the physical condition. Yeah, and, uh, and then, you know, once a year, he'll go look at it and say, oh, it looks like it did last year. Thank you very much. And yeah, most of our code by, uh, in, in ordinances are complaint driven and enforcement. We don't have you know, the chicken police. Uh, I, 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 I don't have a, a, a patrolman wandering around. Hi, thank you for watching Channel 798. Thank you for watching Channel 798. Hi, thank you very much for watching Channel 798.